Now, um, we're going to get back here to Hebrews chapter 7. Now, the whole content of this chapter revolves around this character, Melchizedek. And this is what I'm going to be preaching about this evening. It's called, the title of my sermon is called The Order of Melchizedek. And there's a lot packed into the book of Hebrews that will help us to understand who this Melchizedek is, why he's so important. But um, keep your finger here in Hebrews because we're going to come right back to it. Flip, if you would, to Genesis chapter 14. Genesis 14, we see our first mention of Melchizedek. And really, all the rest of the references in the New Testament are just referring back to this one event that happened in Genesis chapter 14. And it's really even not that much um, that went on, but what did happen is what's important. And um, there is a lot of truth and a lot of learning we're going to get from understanding who Melchizedek is. So if you flip back to Genesis chapter 14, we're going to start looking at verse number 14 of Genesis 14. The Bible says, And when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, and as it, when he says his brother, it's talking about Lot. Um, it wasn't his literal brother, but um, it was a kinsman. There's, the Bible oftentimes will use that word brother. Um, and when Abraham heard that his brother was taken captive, he armed his trained servants, born in his own house, 318, and pursued them unto Dan. And he divided himself against them. Elizabeth sit over. And he divided himself against them, he and his servants, by night, and smote them, and pursued them unto Hobah, which is on the left hand of Damascus. And he brought back all the goods, and also brought again his brother Lot, and his goods, and the women also, and the people. Sit up straight. Abigail, sit over here. One chair over. And the king of Sodom went out to meet him. Verse number 17. After his return from the slaughter of Ketileomer, and of the kings that went with him at the valley of Shavi, which is the king's dale. So basically, just to, I know there's a couple of distractions during the reading of, the, of God's word. Abraham hears that Lot is taken captive. Um, when there was this battle, and remember Lot was living in Sodom, and the kings of Sodom were defeated. These other kings came in and they took all the people hostage. They took them captive and, and were, were going away with them. Abraham hears about this, so he's like, I'm going to go get him back. You know, I mean, that's his brother. That's his kinsman. That's his family. And he goes and brings his hired servants. You know, they go, they fight against them, and they free all these guys. They bring all these captives back is essentially what happens here. So the king of Sodom then meets them and is like, you know, basically, thank you. They bring all the captives and stuff. And it says, um, verse 18, now we're going to see Melchizedek. Okay, this is the Old Testament reference for Melchizedek. And Melchizedek, king of Salem, brought forth bread and wine, and he was the priest of the Most High God. And he blessed him and said, Blessed be Abram of the Most High God, possessor of heaven and earth, and blessed be the Most High God, which hath delivered thine enemies into thy hand. And he gave him tithes of all. Um, so this, this Melchizedek, it's, it's not a very big portion of Scripture that, that, he's, you know, that he has in the Bible, just in general, but there's a lot more in the New Testament explaining a lot more information about Melchizedek. With the information we get from Genesis 14, it says he's the king of Salem, and we're going to learn from Hebrews that the word Salem means peace. He's the king of peace. He's the king of Salem. Um, notice here, he brought forth bread and wine. That's going to be important, and he was the priest of the Most High God. Back in Abraham's days, this is still before Moses, right? This is way before the Mosaic law and the Levitical priesthood where, um, you know, the sons of Levi are the ones given the charge of God's service and the sons of Aaron. Remember, Aaron is the, becomes the high priest and it's his children and his descendants that become the priests after him. So those are the priests of God, but, but none of that has been established yet. That would be the priests in the Levitical priesthood, the sons of Levi. This is prior to that. We see Melchizedek, he's the high priest, he's the priest of the Most High God here in Genesis chapter 14. And we see that Abram, Abraham, when he comes back, he actually pays a tithe. He pays a tenth of the spoil because when he came back, when he freed the captives, he didn't just come back with the people, he came back with all of their stuff. 
right? Because when, when these other kings had, had defeated in battle Sodom and Gomorrah and these other, and these other nations, well, when they left, they took the spoil. They took, you know, cattle and, and things and, you know, all this other stuff as, as their reward for, for defeating the enemy in battle, right? I mean, they're taking captives, they're taking everything that they could and basically looting them and, and bringing it back. So when Abraham goes, he's just concerned about Lot, but since he defeats him in battle and there's all this stuff, he brings all the stuff back to Sodom. Not that he necessarily cares so much about Sodom as he, you know, cares about his family, but when he defeats him is, you know, is the right thing to do. He brings all that stuff back. And um, he paid a tithe of all of that stuff then unto this Melchizedek, the king of Salem. Now, turn back, if you would, to Hebrews. We're going to start reading in Hebrews chapter 4. Well, we're going to be reading, and this is kind of going to be an in-depth Bible study, so try to, try to stay with me here. Try to pay attention and 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 look at these verses because there's a, there's a lot packed into this. And in Hebrews, Hebrews can be a difficult book to understand. Hebrews isn't the most easy doctrinally to get. That's why it says, you know, leaving the, um, you know, the doctrines, uh, the principles of the doctrine of Christ in chapter 6, let us go on unto perfection. There's a lot of doctrine in Hebrews that, that is um, deeper and, and a, little bit, a little bit harder um, than just your basic salvation and, and baptism and those types of things, as, as he says in Hebrews 6. But in Hebrews 4, all, through Hebrews 4 through 7, we're going to be looking at these chapters. It has a lot to do with the priesthood. And this is an important subject to understand. It's a very important part for a long period of time in the Old Testament, that priesthood um, that God has ordained as the priesthood. But it's also important for us to understand today um, because we are actually part of the priesthood. I'm going to get into that a little bit later, how that uh, um, affects us. And, um, but let's start looking here at Hebrews chapter number 4. We're going to go to Hebrews 4, 5, 6, and 7. Hebrews chapter 4, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, Seeing then that we have a great high priest that is passed into the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast our profession. So very clearly we're seeing right now our high priest is Jesus Christ. He is the high priest. Verse number 15, For we have not an high priest which cannot be touched with the feeling of our infirmities, but was in all points tempted like as we are, yet without sin. Let us therefore come boldly unto the throne of grace that we may obtain mercy and find grace to help in time of need. Jesus Christ, um, the reason why he's, he's a high priest, he says it's, we don't have a high priest that can't be touched with the feeling of our infirmities because Jesus Christ was made flesh. He understands our infirmities. He understands what it's like to be a human. He understands the temptations, yet he was without sin. He did everything right but he could understand what we go through and what we deal with. So he is a high priest that we can go to who is going to completely understand us and understand what we need and understand everything about who we are. And he's saying we could come boldly unto the throne of grace. We can boldly come before Jesus Christ to obtain that mercy and find grace and the help of need because we know that he understands us. We don't have to worry about him you know, not getting, not understanding where we're at because he became a man. He, he, he was a man. He gets it. So we could come boldly under that throne and, um, and obtain mercy from him. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 5. That's our first mention of a high priest being Jesus Christ. Hebrews chapter 5, verse number 4. The Bible says, And no man taketh this honor unto himself. He's talking about the honor of being a priest. Okay? No one just comes and just says, like, well, I'm just going to be a priest. He says, but he that is called of God, as was Aaron. So also Christ glorified not himself to be made an high priest, but he that said unto him, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. That's God, of course, saying, thou art my son, today have I begotten thee. God is the one who ordained Jesus Christ as the high priest. You know, Aaron wasn't the one who just decided, hey, I'm going to be the high priest of the people. God ordained him. God's the one who set the rules up, and it's not something you just take upon yourself. It's not an honor you bestow upon yourself. You know, honor is always given unto someone. It's not something you can just take for yourself. It always has to be given. And it says in verse number six, as he saith also in another place, thou art a priest 
forever after the order of Melchizedek. And this is referring to Jesus Christ here. He's saying, um, and this quote actually, you know, verse number 6 of Hebrews 5 says, as he saith also in another place, that's referring to another scripture. So we're going to turn there. If you want to keep your fingers in Hebrews 5, flip over to Psalm 110. That's where this quote is coming from. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Now, Jesus Christ, and we're going to see this in the scripture, he was not born in the lineage of Aaron or of Levi. Remember, Jesus Christ was, came out of Judah, right? The tribe of Judah. If you think of the 12 tribes of Israel, right? Levi is one of those tribes, but Judah is a completely separate one. Je Jesus Christ was born out of the line of Judah. That's where his descendancy comes from. Obviously, God is his father, but his physical human descendancy came through that line of Judah. And Levi is completely separate. And Levi is where, you know, Aaron was a son of, he was a Levite. Uh, Moses was a Levite. These are the people, you know, Aaron was the first high priest and it was through his children where they would um, become high priests in that Old Testament law, in the Levitical priesthood. And um, we, just, we just have to make sure we're getting a clear understanding here because Jesus Christ was never part of that lineage. But he is a priest after the order of, of Melchizedek. So there's the, the order of Aaron or the order of Levi. And then there's the order of Melchizedek. And this is important. Just, just stay with me here because I'm trying to lay some important groundwork to just get a full understanding of this Melchizedek and why it's so important. Psalm 110, we're going to see the quote from Hebrews 5, 6. Um, and this is, we're essentially going to like all the places in the Bible that reference Melchizedek. Okay, that's because we're, we're doing a study on the order of Melchizedek tonight. Psalm 110, look at verse number one, the Bible reads, The Lord said unto my Lord, Sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. Now, and we're, we're going to read all this in context. We're going to see that this is completely talking about Jesus Christ. So you'll probably remember when Jesus Christ said, um, he was questioning the Pharisees and he said, well, how saith um, in the scripture, the Lord said unto my Lord, how can he call him his, his Lord, basically, if he wasn't born yet, right? And he was trying to explain that Jesus Christ is God in the flesh. He's always has been. So in he, Jesus was using this scripture to explain that to him. But um, anyways, I, I'm bringing that up just so you can see right off in context, verse number one, and we're talking about Jesus Christ. The Lord said unto my Lord, sit thou at my right hand until I make thine enemies thy footstool. The Lord shall send the rod of thy strength out of Zion. Rule thou in the midst of thine enemies. Thy people shall be willing in the day of thy power. In the beauties of holiness from the womb of the morning, thou hast the dew of thy youth. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Again, repent just means a change. He's not going to change his mind. The Lord hath sworn and will not repent. Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. The Lord at thy right hand shall strike through kings in the day of his wrath. He shall judge among the heathen. He shall fill the places with the dead bodies. He shall wound the heads over many countries. He shall drink of the brook in the way, therefore shall he lift up the head. So that very quote, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek, we see it come from Psalm 110, completely talking about Jesus Christ. And flip back, if you would, to Hebrews chapter 5, where we just were in verse number 6. Um, that's that, he's reiterating that quote, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. And of course, he's applying it to Jesus Christ, just as it was applied to Jesus Christ in Psalm 110. Look at verse number 7 who in the days of his flesh, when he had offered up prayers and supplications with strong crying and tears unto him that was able to save him from death and was heard in that he feared, though he were a son, yet learned he obedience by the things which he suffered and being made perfect, he became the author of eternal salvation unto all them that obey him called of God and high priest after the order of Melchizedek. Again, we're seeing these phrases over and over again that, that Jesus Christ is he's a high priest and it's after the order of Melchizedek. 
Flip over to Hebrews chapter 6. We're going to look at verse number 17 of Hebrews 6. Because Jesus Christ is our high priest, but he comes after the order of Melchizedek. Hebrews 6, verse number 17 says, Wherein God willing more abundantly to show unto the heirs of promise the immutability of his counsel confirmed it by an oath. Now, that word, there's a few words in here, you know, it might be a little bit confusing, but um, God wanted to show the heirs of promise, which I mean, basically you and me, right? The heirs of his promise, the immutability, the, the, the unchangeable, um, unchangeableness would be the immutability of his counsel, of his wisdom, of, 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 of what he's saying. It, it cannot be changed. He said he confirmed it by an oath. So it's like when God's swearing to something, he's not going to change. And there's no way that could be broken or changed at all because God is true to his word every single time. And if he's making an oath, he said he confirmed it. Not only did he say it, he confirmed it by an oath. This is what we're reading here in Hebrews 6, 17. Look at verse number 18. That by two immutable things, two things that can't change, in which it was impossible for God to lie. So just as a side note, if you're ever looking for a verse that, that you could show someone that just clearly defines it is impossible for God to lie, Hebrews 6.18 is the one to turn to. God cannot lie. We might have a strong consolation who have fled for refuge to lay hold upon the hope set before us, which hope we have as an anchor of the soul. This is, I mean... I love the language used in the King James Bible. It's so descriptive. It so um, explains you know, our hope and of our salvation through Jesus Christ. Hey, God made an oath. God can't lie. There's no way God's going to go back on his word. And we could, I mean, you think of an anchor in a boat. I mean, you drop that anchor, it sinks down into the ground and your boat's staying steady. It's not going anywhere. Well, Jesus Christ is our anchor. We have an anchor for our soul. We could completely rest and trust our, our, our soul in Jesus Christ. He says, Both sure and steadfast, which entereth into that within the veil, whither the forerunner is for us entered, even Jesus made an high priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. Jesus is the high priest forever. Flip over to Hebrews chapter 7. Now, this is where we started reading. This was our main passage when we started um, when we started the sermon tonight and we're going to spend basic, essentially the rest of the time going through Hebrews 7 almost like a, a regular Bible so we're going through these verses because it covers so much about um, the order of Melchizedek and, and look at verse number 1 now we had already flipped back to Genesis chapter 14 to get that story about Melchizedek that this literal story um, uh, the king of Salem was named Melchizedek. He's just, you know, there was a person that Abraham actually gave the tithes to. Okay? And, um, and he blessed them. And, and, and don't forget, because the Bible says that Melchizedek, he brought bread and wine. Right? Look at verse number 1 of, of Hebrews 7, 1. Uh, Hebrews chapter 7, it says, For this Melchizedek, king of Salem, again, we're seeing the same thing, priest of the Most High God, everything we saw in Genesis 14, who met Abraham returning from the slaughter of the kings and blessed him, to whom also Abraham gave a tenth part of all, first being by interpretation king of righteousness, and after that also king of Salem, which is king of peace. Now look at the attributes here. This is talking about Melchizedek. He says he's the king of righteousness, and also after that, king of Salem, which is king of peace. Verse number three, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, but made like unto the Son of God, abideth a priest continually. Now, who do you think, who fits that bill? When we look at that description, who do you know that has no father, no mother, no beginning of days, no end of life, is eternal. He is, right? Remember we talk about I am that I am. That defines eternal. No beginning, no ending. He always has been. 
the king of peace. You could also say the prince of peace, right? The, um, the king of righteousness. But it even says, but made like unto the son of God abideth a priest continually. This is who Melchizedek was. Melchizedek was an Old Testament appearance of the Son of God, of Jesus Christ. That's who Melchizedek was. I mean, there's no other explanations. Otherwise, who else is he going to be? And I like having this conversation about Melchizedek with Mormons and people like that because who else can say they have no beginning? Because they'll believe that Jesus Christ is a created being. Right? They believe people are created or creations or Jehovah's Witness, same thing. Okay, then who is Melchizedek? Because now we have someone here that says that they have no father, they have no mother, they have no descent, they didn't come from anybody, they have no beginning of days, they have no end of life. They've always been. That, that's who Melchizedek is. This made like unto the Son of God, abideth the priest continually. All that was was the physical um, appearance of the Son, of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. And it's, and it's a pretty amazing thing, but we have all the evidence here that we could possibly need to understand that. Now, um, at that time, he didn't come to earth to, to fulfill his role of the Messiah, of Jesus Christ, that, that, that he did later when he came to save the world. That's not why he appeared. He was here for a separate reason. But he was a priest. He was the high priest of God. And that is the order that truly matters. Look at verse number four. He says, Now consider how great this man was. Again, talking about Melchizedek. Unto whom even the patriarch Abraham gave the tenth of the spoils. Now he's going to start going into the importance of Abraham paying a tithe. And paying a tithe. Because he's saying, look, the patriarch Abraham, you got to understand this, especially back at this time when this was written. I mean, even today, the patriarch Abraham is looked up to by the Jews as like, I mean, he is, you know, the godfather, so to speak. Or he's, you know, he is this, this main person. And he is a very important person. He was called the friend of God. You know, he was the one that God chose to bless. And, and, and he's the one out of, out of his seed came Israel, you know, Abraham, Isaac, Jacob, and, and all of the, everybody that God used after that, when God made those promises, he made the promises unto Abraham and to his seed, which is where Jesus Christ came from. Abraham is an extremely important figure. So what they're saying here is, well, wait, Abraham is like one of the most important people in history. One of, he's one of the most important people. And if he's so important, he's so great, he's paying, he's paying tithes to someone else. He's bestowing honor upon someone else and giving the tenth and saying, well, I owe this unto you. You deserve this. I, you know, and Abraham was a great man. So he's saying, well, how much greater is this person now who's receiving that tithe of Abraham? Verse number five, and verily they that are of the sons of Levi who receive the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to the law, that is of their brethren, though they come out of the loins of Abraham. But he whose descent is not counted from them received tithes of Abraham and blessed him that had the promises. Again, him that had the promises is Abraham. He had all these promises from God. And it says he received those tithes. And it says in verse number seven, and without all contradiction, the less is blessed of the better. So when Melchizedek blessed Abraham, the Bible says the less is blessed of the better. So Abraham is the lesser of those two people and Melchizedek is the greater. Melchizedek's the one giving the blessing. He's the greater of the two because he was the son of God. He's, he was Jesus Christ in the flesh. And I'm going to spend a little bit of time talking about the tithe too because this is, this is important to understand this because there's a lot of people today that attack the tithe. And they'll tell you, well, that was Old Testament. That was in the law. That was for the Levitical priesthood. And they'll actually point to Hebrews chapter 7 to say that those things were done away. And because the Levitical priesthood was done away. 
Now, I'm going to prove to you tonight, I'm going to show you that that's just simply not true, and they're misapplying what Hebrews 7 is even talking about and why they're even bringing up the tithe, because the, the fact that it's bringing up the tithe is very important, but I think it proves my point completely and destroys these people who want to deny the tithe altogether. Now, I'm not going to get into all the other various proofs and reasons for the tithe, but just what, what we're seeing here in Hebrews 7 is extremely important, because Keep this in mind too. When Abraham paid the tithe unto Melchizedek, this is before the Levitical priesthood and before that was written in that law to give tithes unto, unto the children of Levi and to give tithes unto the priest. We see a tithe that, that preceded that law. So what is done away with the tithe is we are no longer tithing unto the children of Levi, but the Levites aren't even the priests. They're not, they don't handle the charge of God anymore, so that has changed. But the tithe altogether, or the concept of the tithe, has not been done away. The tithe existed before the Levitical priesthood, and the tithe still exists after the Levitical priesthood. But let's keep reading here because they really, I mean, Hebrews 7 really talks in depth about the tithe and it's making a very important um, point that, that Abraham actually paid tithe. They say in, um, in verse number five, we already read this, but he says, and verily they that are the sons of Levi who received the office of the priesthood have a commandment to take tithes of the people according to law that is of their brethren though they come out of the, the loins of Abraham. Um, that's not the verse I was looking for, but he's saying that um, he's just referring to the, to the Old Testament law of the Levitical priesthood taking the tithes. But Abraham paid tithes. Look at verse number 8. It says, And here men that die receive tithes, but there he receiveth them of whom it is witness that he liveth. Verse number nine, and as I may say, as I may so say, Levi also who receiveth tithes paid tithes in Abraham, for he was yet in the loins of his father when Melchizedek met him. So they're saying even Levi now, who are the ones that receive the tithes, according to Levitical priesthood, even Levi paid tithes because they're saying that he was still in the loins of Abraham. Like they, he wasn't even born yet, but even the people who are receiving tithes now, they paid tithes to this Melchizedek. Now, um, why is there so much talk about the tithe being paid to Melchizedek? Why is this so important? Like, why, why do they focus so much on this event happening? The reason why is because the tithe belongs to God. And I'm going to prove that to you for just from a few um, places in Scripture. Genesis 28. You, you can turn these places or not if you want to. I'll go through them pretty quickly. Genesis 28, verse number 20. We're going to see Jacob. And guess what Jacob did? Jacob also pays a tithe unto God. Right? This is before the Levitical priesthood. This is before Moses. Right? Jacob becomes Israel. And Israel has the 12 tribes. Pre, it predates that. So we see not just Abraham paid tithes. Now we're going to see Jacob also paid tithes. Genesis 28, verse 20, And Jacob vowed a vow, saying, If God will be with me, and will keep me in this way that I go, and will give me bread to eat and raiment to put on, and remember from this morning, heaven, therefore, food and raiment, let us be there with content. Jacob, that's all he's asking. He's saying, God, if you're going to feed me, if you're going to clothe me, right? Verse number 21, So that I come again to my father's house in peace, then shall the Lord be my God. And this stone which I have set for a pillar shall be God's house. And of all that thou shalt give me, I will surely give the tenth unto thee. The tenth is the tithe. Jacob made a vow and saying, well, everything that when you give it to me, God, I'm going to give you one tenth of that right back to you. That's exactly what Abraham did. That's what Jacob did. This is before the, the, the Levitical priesthood. Levit Leviticus 27. Leviticus 27 verse 30 says, And all the tithe of the land, whether of the seed of the land or of the fruit of the tree, is the Lord's. 
it is holy unto the Lord. It means it belongs unto the Lord. Verse number 32 of the same chapter. And concerning the tithe of the herd or of the flock, even of whatsoever passeth under the rod, the tenth shall be holy unto the Lord. This is explaining the tithe on the children of Israel under the Levitical priesthood. They're saying, look, the tithe belongs to the Lord. And then, of course, Malachi chapter 3, verse number 8 says, Will a man rob God? Yet ye have robbed me. But you say, wherein have we robbed you? You're saying, what, what do you mean? We call us robbers, God. How did we rob you? He says, in tithes and offerings. So how else could it be robbery unless that's something that already belongs unto God? The tithe belongs to God. He says, it's mine. You need to pay it because it's mine. Not because you're doing me a favor. Not because you're just giving me something out of your heart. He's saying, this is a command. This is a demand. You, you owe this to me. I give you everything. You need to give me one-tenth back. And that's how you rob God. It's in tithes and offerings. This isn't something that was only just for the, the, the children of Levi. And somehow you're robbing God when you don't support the children of Levi. No, he says the tithe belongs to me. The tenth belongs unto me. Which is the whole reason why they're bringing this up about Abraham paying tithes to Melchizedek. Because Melchizedek was God in the flesh. It was Jesus Christ walking on this earth. The tithe belonged unto him. And that's why he paid it. And that's the, the, what's being emphasized here and, and really going over that this, this, this uh, point of the tithe. Let's keep reading now back in Hebrews chapter 7. If, in case you had flipped over and looked at any of these references, we'll go back to Hebrews chapter 7, verse number 11. The Bible says, If therefore perfection were by the Levitical priesthood, for under it the people received the law, what further need was there that another priest should rise after the order of Melchizedek and not be called after the order of Aaron. For the priesthood being changed, there is made of necessity a change also of the law. Important phrase because it's explaining that we are no longer, and especially at this time, because a lot of people were still following and practicing the Levitical priesthood ways from, from the Old Testament. He's saying that, okay, now Jesus is a priest under a different order, under the order of Melchizedek. Because the priesthood now has changed, it's changed back to this order of Melchizedek, the law needs to have some changes too. We're no longer going to be offering up these sacrifices. We're no longer going to be doing, you know, a lot of all the things that the rest of the book of Hebrews spells out as being changed. And some of the other epistles explain as well that there were made some changes. He says, but because the priesthood has changed, there's made also of necessity a change also of the law. So people who deny the tithe and say you don't have to pay that, they'll turn to Hebrews 7. They'll say, see, look, it mentions the tithe and then it mentions that there's a change in the law. So therefore, we must not have to pay the tithe anymore. And completely just don't see the whole reason why the tithe was even brought up in the first place. Why was it brought up? It was brought up because of Melchizedek, because of the tithe that was paid before that law was ever even intro introduced. It had nothing to do with the Levitical tithe. It had to do with the tithe given to Melchizedek. To prove who, uh, who Melchizedek was and that the tithe belonged unto him. So that argument that they, when they go to this makes no sense. Were things changed? Of course they were changed. Does that mean that there is no tithe supposed to be given for anything, anywhere um, at all? No. There's still, God still has his house. Now, has he changed the, the, do we still meet in the temple? No. We meet in a local church. Do we still, you know, there's a lot of things that are different. Do we still offer up sacrifices? No, we don't. The Bible says uh, we don't meet in the temple. The body is our temple, right? We have the Holy Spirit residing inside of us. There's, you know, God can speak to our hearts directly. He's written in our hearts and in our minds His laws and His words. And um, all these things being changed, yet there still is a bishop. There still is a pastor. There still are people who are, in, who are given a charge by God to do a certain work. And, you know, again, the New Testament explains that... Um, they that, that preach the gospel should live of the gospel. And there's, there's many other references that explain that it is appropriate for a pastor to be paid. And if a pastor is going to be paid through the church, then um, it only makes sense that it's going to come from the tithe. Because that's exactly what was used in the Old Testament with the priests to support them so that they could have full-time service to God. 
they would receive a tie. They would receive compensation for that work so that they don't have to work another job and do the work of a priest. And it's the same thing in the New Testament. Um, the tithe has been around even prior to the Levitical priesthood. But um, I just wanted to point that out because it's an important point to make and people will try to turn to Hebrews 7 to, to use it as proof that we don't have to pay a tithe. But that is completely false. Um, and that's just what the Bible says. I don't care what people think like, oh yeah, you're just preaching for me. Yeah, listen to my sermons because that's what I'm preaching for. Because that's what I care about. I care about the big money coming in and, and paying me a salary. You can judge that for yourself if you think I'm just preaching for money up here. Judge that in yourself. But um, if you're just going to say because a pastor's getting paid, he's automatically preaching for money, you're wrong and that's wicked. You better have proof of that because all the verses that, that talk about that are against a, a person preaching for filthy lucre's sake, that's what their intent is. That's what their motivation is, is money. So just because someone receives some money doesn't mean that that is, the, that is their motivation for preaching. That it's just to receive more money and just to get more money. That's what preaching for filthy lucre's sake means. So when you're going to accuse somebody of that, don't say that just because the church supports them through the tithes so that they could continually be dedicated to the Word of God and to ministering the Word of God. Because that is the reason why they receive any tithe in the first place and, and are compensated so that they could give themselves over continually to prayer and to um, the, the ministering of the Word of God. And someone who's, who's doing it for the right reasons, they're not preaching for filthy lucre's sake. I'm sick of these, these false accusers that just anyone who receives, a, receives any compensation for, for doing the work of a pastor or of a bishop, they're automatically just preaching for money. It's not true. When you, they, they use these verses out of context and they misapply them to people who are doing the right thing and are doing the work of God. And they're not preaching for money. They're preaching um, because they were called of God to do that. But um, let's keep reading here. So verse number 13 says, For he of whom these things are spoken pertaineth to another tribe of which no man gave attendance at the altar. For it is evident that our Lord sprang out of Judah. And this is why I, I covered this earlier. Of which tribe Moses spake nothing concerning priesthood. And it is yet far more evident. For that after the similitude of Melchizedek, there ariseth another priest who is made not after the law of a carnal commandment, but after the power of an endless life. Again, we see, the, the, of course, Jesus Christ has an endless life. And um, he didn't come to... The gospel isn't obeying the carnal commandments. It's not obeying the, the laws. It's faith through, through Christ and through his, uh, what he did for us. Verse number 17, For he testifieth, Thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. For there is verily a disannulling of the commandment going before for the weakness and unprofitableness thereof. For the law made nothing perfect, but the bringing in of a better hope did, by the which we draw nigh unto God, and inasmuch as not without an oath he was made priest. For those priests were made without an oath, but this with an oath by him that said unto him, The Lord swear and will not repent, thou art a priest forever after the order of Melchizedek. By so much was Jesus made a surety of a better testament. And they truly were many priests because they were not suffered to continue by reason of death. So he's saying there were many high priests under Levitical priesthood because they couldn't continue because they would die because they were human beings, right? That Levitical priesthood would, it, it, it changed as people would die. There'd be other priests would rise up into, into doing that same office and doing that same job because they're just human beings. But he's explaining, but Jesus Christ, because he lives forever, he is always that high priest. He always has that job. Verse number 24 says, but this man, because he continueth ever, hath an unchangeable priesthood. The priesthood never changes. It's always with Jesus Christ, the high priest. Verse number 25, wherefore he is able also to save them to the uttermost that come unto God by him, seeing he ever liveth to make intercession for them. For such an high priest became us, who is holy, 
harmless, undefiled, separate from sinners, and made higher than the heavens. And again, we see this. This is a much more complicated um, description or explanation of Jesus Christ being God in the flesh. But it is nonetheless. It is exactly saying Jesus Christ is everlasting. He has no beginning. He has no ending. He's separate from sinners. He's always there to make intercession for us. He's made higher than the heavens. You know, he's undefiled, holy. This is all talking about Jesus Christ. This can be used as another um, support to support the deity of Jesus Christ. It's just a lot more complicated because um, it's not quite as clear-cut as many other verses are. But it's saying the same exact same thing. Verse number 27, who needeth not daily as those high priests offer up sacrifice first for his own sins and then for the people's. For this he did once when he offered up himself. For the law maketh men high priests which have infirmity. But the word of the oath which was since the law maketh the son who is consecrated forevermore. So real briefly, the last point I want to I cover tonight is you know, the priests in the Old Testament, they were of the tribe of Levi, right? That's how they became a priest. So basically, you had to be born into that job. There was no other way to, to, to become one of the priests. Not only did they have to come be born of Levi, specifically, they were of the children of Aaron. The entire tribe of Levi, they had the service of God. They would help with doing um, just many of the tasks involved with, you know, at, at one point, setting up the tabernacle, taking it down, who was in charge of all the different things. Um, also, the, the daily sacrifices and, and all these other things as well. But then um, the job of the, of the high priest, he went into the holiest place of all within the veil, and he would do specific sacrifices and certain jobs and tasks were given unto them, as, uh, given unto him as the high priest. And um, so in the Old Testament, you had to be of the, the tribe of Levi, you had to be a lineage of, of Aaron. And not only that, the, high, the priests were always anointed with oil. That was part of their ceremony. When they have a new priest, they would anoint them with oil. Now, why am I bringing all of this up? Because in the New Testament, that Levitical priesthood is done away. We saw that that Levitical priesthood doesn't exist anymore. But the priesthood has changed. It's no longer that Old Testament way, but it's under the order of Melchizedek. There are still priests. There's one high priest, it's Jesus Christ. But in the New Testament, we are born into that priestly line. Just like the Levi, you, know, you had to be a child of Levi, or a child of Aaron, a son of Aaron, to be a priest. Well, when you're a son of God today or son of Jesus, that's how you become born into this priestly line. So every believer is born, you know, we believe in the priesthood of the believer is what it's known as. We believe that we are priests today. And it, when we are born again, that's when we're born into that priestly line. And when they were anointed with oil, that's like us receiving the anointing of the Holy Spirit. We have the Holy Spirit that resides within us. That is our anointing. It follows that same pattern of the Levitical priesthood, but in a better way. That was a carnal way. Those, those, everything that happens in the Old Testament, all of these laws, all of these ceremonies are given as a foreshadowing of things to come. They're all symbols of things that are to happen later on. And it's amazing because you look at this, if you ever wonder why, like why do, they, why do they anoint them with oil? Why do they do that? Why do they do some of these things when they become the priests? And sometimes you don't understand that. But the, the New Testament helps explain a lot of that. It says, hey, look, well, that anointing was for a reason. It symbolizes the anointing that we receive when we receive the Holy Spirit. So we become a, a priest in a similar way that they did, just in a much better way. We're born into it. We're born when we're born again. And we're anointed when we receive the anointing of the Holy Spirit that resides inside of us. Jesus is the high priest, but we are also a part of that priesthood. The last place, let's turn to 1 Peter chapter number 2, right near the end of the Bible. 1 Peter chapter 2 is the last place, and then we're done. 1 Peter chapter number 2, I just want you to see this for yourself, because I kind of have, have said that we're this priesthood, but I didn't really prove it to you yet. 1 Peter chapter 2 will prove that to you. I don't like to make statements without being able to show you the scripture behind it from the Bible. Okay, you can see where, the, where I'm getting some of these um, 
you know, the, the priesthood and the anointing and everything else. And you could say it makes sense, but show me, prove it in the Bible. Okay, I'll prove it in the Bible. First Peter chapter number two, look at verse number five. The Bible says, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood. So it says right there, we're a holy priesthood to offer up spiritual sacrifice. Well, you know, what? let's just go back. Let's jump back because I'm, I'm starting off where, and where I wanted to start with verse five. Let's just get it all in context. Let's start with verse number one. Wherefore, laying aside all malice and all guile and hypocrisies and envies and all evil speakings, as newborn babes desire the sincere milk of the word that ye may grow thereby, if so be ye have tasted that the Lord is gracious, to whom coming as unto a living stone, disallowed indeed of men, but chosen of God and precious, ye also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house and holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wherefore also it is contained in the scripture, Behold, I lay in Sion a chief cornerstone, elect, precious, and he that believeth on him shall not be confounded. Unto you therefore which believe, he is precious. But unto them which be disobedient, the stone which the builders disallowed, the same is made the head of the corner and a stone of stumbling and a rock of offense, even to them which stumble at the word, being disobedient, whereunto also they were appointed. But ye are a chosen generation, a royal priesthood, and holy nation, a peculiar people, that ye should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness and into his marvelous light, which in time past were not a people, but are now the people of God which had not obtained mercy, but now have obtained mercy. So you can see by the context here that he's talking about believers. He's talking about those that put their faith in Christ. And he's, and he's drawing the, the difference between those which believe and those that don't believe. And he's saying to you that believe, you know, he's the rock. He's that, that, that chief cornerstone. And to those that don't believe, um, you know, that's this, the, the cornerstone is the stumbling block unto them. And those that believe, he says, but you are a royal priesthood. You, you who are not God's people in time past, now you are God's people. Now you have come to this, this priesthood um, title or role that you can play as a, a holy priest of God because we are made that way through the blood of Jesus Christ, through faith in his name. Um, God has brought us close to him and, and made us partakers of that heavenly calling. And it's important to understand these things. Melchizedek's kind of an interesting character in the Bible because you see, especially when you see the phrase, you know, he, without father, without mother, without descent, having neither beginning of days nor end of life, abideth a priest continually. So what's that talking about? That has to be talking about Jesus Christ. That's what, who he was. Jesus Christ made, and you think about it, he didn't even just make that one appearance. You remember when Shadrach, Meshach, and Abednego got thrown into the burning fiery furnace? There were three of them thrown into there, but then when the king saw, he's like, well, wait, I see four people, and the fourth is like the Son of God. Right? Again, they got thrown in there, and Jesus made an appearance that was walking with them in that furnace of fire. Um, you see a few references like that of, of these appearances of Jesus Christ in the Old Testament. But in none of those appearances did he come to fulfill his role as, as Jesus Christ um, that he came to do, um, obviously, with, with, from all the New Testament passages. And um, So anyways, don't let anyone confuse you about who Melchizedek was. He's a good person to use to show the Jehovah's Witnesses and Mormons about who this is because they believe everything and everybody is a created being except for God. They believe that, that God is the only one that's like pre-existent, that is truly eternal. Show them Melchizedek. They ask, how could that be? And then don't let these people deceive you about the, the tithe either. The tithe had been going on before the children of Levi and the tithe still continues after the Levitical priesthood. It's... Um, it has a very specific purpose and um, just don't let people, and especially if they're going to turn to Hebrews 7, 
Now you can understand why that what they're saying is just completely false. But let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer. Dear Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you so much um, for your words and for this scripture. Dear God, I know it's kind of a, a little bit of a deeper sermon tonight, but um, it's important that we understand who, who these people are, especially there's so many references that you made to the, the priesthood being changed in the order of Melchizedek, dear Lord. And I think you're just driving home the fact that um, you know salvation does not come through obedience to the law but by the faith of Jesus Christ. All of those commandments and all the laws that were given were given um, under the direction of Moses to, um, for the people to follow. It's not that, that those laws aren't important, but we know that those laws do not represent salvation. Jesus Christ brings us salvation, and he was not a priest through that Levitical priesthood or the priesthood that gave us the law. He is a priest through the order of Melchizedek, which is a much more perfect uh, priesthood, dear Lord, and he's our priest that abideth forever and is always able to make intercession for us sinners, dear Lord. We love you. We thank you for giving us such a high priest that was made flesh, that understands the infirmity of our flesh, dear Lord. And we thank you, thank you, thank you for explaining to us that we can truly come boldly unto the throne of grace, that we don't have to shy away, we don't have to be timid, but we can come boldly unto the throne of grace to receive your mercy. We love you and we thank you for that. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.